right, now we are back with another Content Minded. I know it's been a few weeks, but I've been busy doing other things. I have to, you know, chase the Cole report. And uh, what episode is this? This is 65? Yeah, that's right, 65. Because the last one was a deep dive on Kowloon Walled City. I hope you people appreciated that. That took me a lot of work, by the way. So you better go to patreon.com slash Um, I'm thinking of, uh, well, I mean, not increasing. Oh, what am I talking about? I, I think I might have to go back to half and a half. Or, well, I'll give more for the public thing. But I've, I've noticed I've given, I don't know, I'm too, I'm not as heartless to do the Mystery Grove thing where he just basically only cares about paid subs. But I don't know. I I think I don't know what I I don't know who who knows who knows at this point. You know who knows because it is like whatever I get I get, and uh, life is too short. I don't know. I've been going through some stuff lately, and so it's made me think about certain things, and it makes me think about uh, how much I've really been an island, if you will. Uh, I want content minded, especially with the core report. Uh, the core report being almost all paywalled for obvious reasons. But I, I wanted the content minded to be a bit more higher brow and less topical of like, here's the news, here's the discourse, blah, blah, blah. I want to, you know, do more, I guess, stimulating things. There's a lot of theory cells that do podcasts. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of them I have blocked, by the way, for obvious, a lot of them are like leftoids and whatnot. But anyways, I've been thinking about a lot of things and how, uh, I don't really fit in one particular place and how the general scene, quote unquote, if there is such a thing, is manifesting into a form of exhaustion. And I think a lot of that is because... Uh, well, it doesn't feel like an election year. 2016 is far behind us. I don't even know if Trump winning would be the answer to a revitalization of what you could call the E-right, or, well, particularly the Twitterati version of the E-right. I don't know, man. Like, I think everyone just wants to get the bag somehow, and uh, that's the way it is. And even me, I want to the bag but anyways i i wanted to talk more about something I, I think it was a few episodes ago i mentioned or rather someone donated to, to me it may have been owen zaleski or there's been a few people not just owen zaleski but there's a few other people in uh one in particular in the patreon discord server about well, who is your favorite artists Who's your favorite artists? And I wanted to go over one artist in particular that I've found inspiration from over the years and I think is deeply important for all of this talk that people had or well have or had about, well, what about like the right wing, you know, doing uh, art and uh, what about that and, you know, all the anyways without getting too cynical about these things. There's even one of these, uh, I shouldn't even mention, because honestly, he's he's not worth mentioning, but he was going on, if you go to my Telegram, you know who I'm talking about. This particular, uh, you know, I shouldn't even hint at uh, the particular presidential candidate he was supporting, but he had this take that's basically the take I've had for many years, which is that there's a lot of talk about people on the right wing doing uh, or supporting artists at least or creating something aesthetic and artistic and meaningful in terms of general cultural creation. And, of course, stealing takes that me and Fan and Matthew the Stout have had for many years now. But whatever, it's, it's neither here nor there. The point being is that he's partially correct, but then he's like, I forget what movie. I think it was a Ryan Gosling movie. It's a movie that I know for a fact every single right-wing film critic has done 
has expounded upon endlessly from Devin Stack all the way down to even us on the Digital Archipelago. But anyways, that's besides the point. He's a nobody. Uh, and he did this thing, this take, and I was really thinking about that. I was thinking about how the problem is there is people that have written about models of what you would consider, quote unquote, right wing art. First of all, the whole thing about like right wing art to, to, I mean, that's like literally something that uh, the communists do is to sort of politicize the work of art. That's not something that artists who have been sympathetic to the right wing or to various rightist movements throughout the centuries have really done. It's not a matter of putting an ideal. I've, I've, again, I'm talking in cliches, but it's a cliche that are truths. Uh, stuff that I've talked about for a long time. Which is you really can't put an ideological maxim upon I am creating with this intention to be this based in red pill, whatever. Some people might disagree, but there is something to be said about producing something that comes from a a Weltanschauung, a worldview that is outside of the current transnational progressivist, uh, progressive ideological maxims. I'm, I'm sure I said this in DM, trying to slowly bring that word back. It was very popular in the 2000s, in the 2010s, but it seems people have abandoned it. The word transy or transnational progressivism to describe what people would call the regime. And I guess globalists just took over that term. But you can't really say, oh, I'm going to make like anti-globalist, anti-whatever art, because that's usually I'm that's usually just a formula for making propaganda. And in some sense, the line between art and propaganda is incredibly blurry. And so in some ways, a lot of those like left wing art critics are at least somewhat correct. Again, yeah, I know the woke is more correct than mainstream, blah, blah, blah. But for example, Guernica is a monumental work of art. But Guernica, let's face it, is a propaganda piece, right? But that's not to say that, even though I don't disagree, I disagree with his, uh, with the, you know, Picasso sentiments there about Franco and so forth. The point being is that you can still look at something as a monumental work of art without looking at it as, oh, well, this is propaganda and it has no artistic merit because we think of the work of art as something that is like this purely angelic form, uh, noumenal reality that doesn't touch the particulars of the matter of the world. But really, the, the work of art is, in some sense, a part of that noumenal realm, but in another sense, does touch the particulars, does touch matter, does touch the worldly. And this is undeniable, because the artist themselves they are of the worldly. Some of them are not of the worldly, in my opinion. Some of them are beyond the worldly, but yet communicate with the worldly. Because that's just a reality that we live in. And I think that it's not to say that if art has a politics, that it's corrupted. But at the same time, if your intention is to be like, I'm going to make this based in red pill work of art, I think, outs I mean, I'm talking more specifically in the confines of visual art, because I think cinema is different because cinema often does lend itself to a social messaging because anything, whether it be writing or cinema, has to have a narrative function. The way that painting does have a narrative function, but painting oftentimes has an immediacy of narrative functions. Whereas things like a novel, things like even cinema especially, will naturally lend itself to a form of social realism. I mean, there's forms of fantasy and unreality and, and uh, fantastical realism, but when it comes to like hard-nosed social realism, those are the genres that fit. And painting as well. I mean, there is social realism as well in painting. But it seems that when it comes to visual art, there's more of a room to be like, okay, you could just make a whatever. And it could just be in itself an art object. Whereas nowadays, there's such a demand on popular media, be it video games or movies especially, because, like, let's face it, not a lot of people read novels anymore, unfortunately. But, so therefore, the demand of the social messaging is always there. You always have these MB kids with their Wacom tablets and their cute, kitschy little uh, avatars, and they're flipping out because, oh, recently, uh, I'll, 
I'll cover it with Catherine, actually. I'm going to save that for the computer room because we're going to talk about it. Recently, there's this been this explosion of these confessional and uh, trauma comics on Twitter and elsewhere. They usually come, I think they go viral on Instagram and TikTok. And, and then the, uh, the comic people, they talk about their experiences. And it's always the perspective of a young woman or whatever. And there's just been an explosion of this recently where they've resurrected that one painting from that Italian director that has to do with RPing, if you know what I mean. And people are making counter memes on it. I'll talk about it a little bit in the core part, but I think I'll go in depth with Catherine because honestly, I, I don't want to talk about that on this podcast. I don't want to soil my podcast by... I don't want to soil content-minded by talking about Cole. I would never do that. But anyways, I've always done that. But the point being is that there is a demand, even a visual art, to conform to a particular social orthodoxies, but in a way that is affirming. It is, and that's the essence of kitsch, by the way. It is something that is, what would you call it, unyielding positivity, but masked in the socio-political messaging. That is the essence of neoliberal kitsch, which hopefully you will read about that this year in my book. So I've seen this explosion of that, but my point being is that you can create the work of art that has a messaging, but ideally transcends the ephemerality of current politics. Because if you're going to do that, then just make memes. And there's a lot of brilliant memes that spoof current situations. There's a lot of hanging soy jacks that it, it, some of them just look incredible, right? Not to say I endorse that, but some of them, well, some of them, they look, uh, you know, I mean, there is an artistry to meme culture as well, especially when you have very hyper-specific memes. People can place memes in the right context and they just, they, they have a finesse to them. Uh, my favorite genre is where you'll have like some like redditor soylennial you'll have like some irony leftist and uh, my good mutual solion who i think will be on the show soon as and, and not that i endorse everything that him or a lot of the anime youth uh say or do or whatever but i love how he like he always manages to find when he sees an irony leftist who's like a, you know aging pretty close to 40 years old he always manages to find a tweet where they're talking about depression and then he'll like quote tweet it with them because what will happen is he'll say something like you're brown or whatever and then you'll have an Arnie leftist that will like legit like they'll threaten him or they'll do the whole shove you in a locker you're a loser or the one thing that I really hate is they'll like make a story about hey I knew this guy in high school and he was like you know doing like they lie about you. And they think it's funny because that's like literally aging Gen Xer, older millennial humor, right? He'll always quote tweet them and he'll find exactly uh, where they're talking about their meds, their depression, and it's hilarious. But anyways, anyways, I'm getting off topic. So uh, the, the whole thing about, th this is a preamble to what I wanted to talk about, is that there is no model for people to do quote unquote reactionary or right wing art. Now there are people who have written about this. Uh, one name that comes to mind is Ezra Pound. Um, I've read a bit of Ezra Pound, but I'm not that well-versed in poetry. Well, I, I, I'm a little bit well-versed in poetry, but I have to go through all of the cantos, and I, I love a lot of his uh, singular poetry. But there was... Uh, I don't know if I should mention him. I'm not going to mention him, but let's say, because it's an optical, uh, whatever, but there's this book... I believe it was published by Countercurrents about artists on the right or something of that nature. Um, I don't know if I should even mention this. I don't know if I should pay all well this. But anyways, the point being is that there are there there have been artists that I think you wouldn't necessarily label quote unquote like right wing in a contemporary context of like oh here is my based and red pilled artist. Here is my based racist anti whatever artist, but you would say that they have a particular flair and a particular worldview that may not necessarily be clearly like okay they they supported this fascist regime although with Ezra Pound we all know 
besides the point. But there have been artists that have instantiated a, a meaningful worldview and a form of even mysticism by which they have created the works of art that could lend itself potentially to a model of what we mean by a countercultural rightward direction that isn't necessarily beating you over the head with a form of hyper-politicization of everything. That isn't necessarily just spitting out propaganda. And one of the most impactful artists, and I believe it, I'll stray into the paywall version. I'll, I'll do two essays on this artist because it answers the question of, okay, who inspired me as well? Now, there are a lot of artists that have inspired me over the years, going back to when I first began doing, you know, really doing art, I would say in or around high school. But I think like high school to early undergrad. Now, there are names like, of course, the New York School, but even before the New York School, I was always fascinated by Mark Toby. And I will actually, maybe I will do a content minded on Mark Toby because I always wanted to write about him. But the one artist, so um, I always had a fascination with abstract expressionism. And at the time, I was really heavy into the New Age stuff. And so Mark Toby really spoke to me. But the artist I wanted to talk about today was another one that really spoke to me on a deep level. An artist that is, I would say, quite popular around certain segments of the E-Right around certain, you know, aesthetic posters. But I think to really understand this artist is key. And this is what this episode will be a deep dive on. Um, and I eventually will get to the, the Italian art gallery burning various paintings. But the artist I'm talking about is, of course, Nikolai Rorish. The title, you know, the title of this episode. So... Nikolai Rorish, I wanted to read an essay that goes through his life. It goes through it from an academic perspective. I'd say that this is a very good paper. Not that I agree with everything on it, because it is written by you know modern academic. But Nikolai Rorish was pretty much close to the, the few sort of perennialist mystic painters that actually did go to art school that has a wide and voluminous body of work and yes, I know that there was uh, connections to the theosoph Theosophical Society, and there's problems with that. And I know a lot of perennialists, such as, uh, I believe, Charles Upton, they don't really, you know, Christian Amerti famously left them when they thought he was going to be the newest, like, uh, you know, Rama or Christ-like figure. But th there's a lot of deep lore about Theosophy, and a lot of people, even in the e right that I've talked to behind the scenes... They, like, you know, a lot of this stuff from Belotsky and so forth, a lot of them were kooks and crazies and they were like proto-libs and they were charlatans and so forth. But, you know, I, that being said, I, I, I remain neutral on this topic. I think that some of these writings are quite fascinating. So, not to say that Nikolai Rorish is discredited because he was involved in various mystical schools... In terms of the sort of the popularity, especially in the 2010s, and I think this is also why Nikolai Rorish, not just the theosophy stuff, but and his connection to the symbolist movement, but, you know, becoming popular, especially around the 2010s, in certain segments of, like, online mystical right-wing discourse... Because of the whole, like, pan-Eurasianism stuff. And because of the fact that he really tried to create a sort of, like, what would you call it? Like a Eurasianist, uh, you know, Asian, fusion, European, mystical school. He was trying to find Shambhala. He was trying to create an aesthetic through his works of art, around an awareness of a collective mythology, a collective mythopoetics that bridges the gap between the East and the West. 
And so let's go through this essay. And I think uh, Nikolai Rorish, there are certain individual paintings that I've talked about even on this channel. And there's certain ones that really speak to me. But his body of work, like for example, Mother of the World, I did a whole video on. Uh, depicting of the Theokatos or Sophia of Wisdom. And even though a lot of this stuff comes off as heretical, a lot of it, I think, has a place for an instantiation of a mystical form of art that isn't like just kitschy New Age, you know, Alex Gray type of stuff. That there's something more there. That he's more similar to Ernst Fuchs than he is Alex Gray, put it that way. So, for example, there's this other painting he did called the Oroflame, the Golden Flame, a pointed blood-red banner flown from a, a gilded lance was the sacred blood battle standard of King of France, symbol of divine intervention the battle from, uh, battlefield from God, St. Denis of the Middle Ages. But here he depicts a woman holding the flag, Madonna Oroflame. She is seen holding the banner of peace. So the Madonna is a conqueror, and she, he made this in 1932. Madonna is a conqueror, but the Madonna comes up over and over again because he depicts her in both something that is akin, and of course you have the P and X cross. He depicts her both in Eastern Rite and in a lot of the Orthodox influence, but also bridging over into a, a sort of Eastern influence in a lot of ways that you'd find women depicted, for example, in Iranian miniatures, in different forms of uh, shamanic rituals that you'd find in Siberia. He was very well aware of all of this. Even in Tibet, you have certain female Buddhas. Um, the Madonna figure, again, with a symbol piece, Madonna Protectoress, over the Vatican City, over France, the sort of, I believe, Notre Dame is there and a bunch of other very sacred sites. So he is open to Christianity as well, even though his artwork is more well known. And, you know, he paints Christ as well. But his artwork, of course, you know, as, as for as much as he paints a lot of uh, pictures, uh, pictures of Christ and Madonna, especially doing it in a way that's similar to Eastern iconography. And again, one day I will have my good friend Shane Swenson on the show. He does depict a lot of saints in, in the field, in the Eurasian steppe. He, but he is more well known for his depictions of the Buddha, of various other Buddhas, and of a lot of Eastern mysticism. And there's a lot of Buddhas throughout the Ural Mountains, through the Kalish, and through other various mountain steppes or sacred holy mountains. Uh, created uh, the American Russian Culture Association... Where, by the way, there is a museum, which one day I'll probably visit in New York if I ever get the chance. Creating New York, its active presence was Ernest Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway. Rockwell Kent. And again, even though he was a communist, he was one of my favorite artists ever. I think Rockwell Kent was one of the most brilliant wood engravers to have ever lived. And I think, uh, maybe I'll talk about it a bit more. Charlie Chaplin. Emil Cooper. Sergei Kostovsky, who was uh, another great conductor uh uh Turchenko? oh wow and a bunch of other ones uh a bunch of other artists as well went to the center and participated in it and uh oh he even uh Rorish received Jolahara Nuru and her and his daughter Indira Gandhi at his house in Kulu so I believe yes that's right he lived in India for a number of years near the Himalayas as well. And I believe he was also a mountaineer. So in 1934, so I'm just reading his Wikipedia page. U.S. Department of Agriculture then headed by the Rorish admirer Henry A. Wallace. How, how deep, how deep does Nikolai Rorish go? Of course, Henry Wallace was uh, there during the Roosevelt administration the FDR administration, serves as the 11th Secretary of Agriculture and the Secretary of Commerce, nominated for New Progressive Party, and of course he was big on the National Parks thing. Strong supported the New Deal and presided over a major shift in federal agricultural policy. Uh, well, the New Deal policies, as we know, are, well, me and Prude, you know, we talk about that. 
its its uh, lasting legacy. Accusations of communist influence follows and Wallace's association with controversial theosophy figure Nikolai Rorish undermined this campaign. Well, I mean, Rorish was not a communist, by the way. He was, uh... I mean, nowadays you would even accuse him of being a fascist or whatever, right? Because, uh, as you know, all people that are involved nowadays in any form of Eurasianism are, are uh, labeled as fascists. H.P. Lovecraft described Rorish's paintings of Asian mountain landscapes as strange and disturbing numerous times in the Asiatic horror story at the Mountains of Madness. He info. You want to talk about right-wing art? You want to talk about, oh, the artists of the right? He influenced H.P. Lovecraft. And his mountains, and, and some of them, they, they look almost like demonic figures, but in the context of Vajrana Buddhism, for instance, in Tibet, you know, they, they don't have a, they, it's, it's closer to the older form in pagan, uh, not that I'm, you know, doing a syncretism thing, but it's closer to the understanding in Western paganism of a daemon, a daemonic rather than demonic, which isn't necessarily malevolent, but rather can become a force of nature and so forth. And, uh, you know, of course, he was, um, he was, you know, he, he knew people like H.G. Wells. He knew people like the, you know, amazing poet uh, Rabindranath Tagore. Tagore, of course, was good friends with Ananda Kumaraswamy, who I'm recently doing a painting of with him and Tagore. Uh, even Gorky. He knew Gorky, Maxim Gorky. And he, you know, he knew a lot of these artists, and he was sort of a mystical figure that lived in these various places throughout the world and created a form of syncretic mystical artwork that is, in my opinion, cannot be found anywhere else. So let's, I wanted to read from, to you, and I think I'll do the paywalled version. I will read an essay on Tibetan art in his book called Shambhala, In Search of a New Era. And I highly recommend getting this book, Shambhala. Because it outlines a lot of his travels, but it also outlines his particular um, perennialist and syncretic understanding of these different wisdom traditions. And so notice how, you know, his artwork isn't about uh, certain painters of Austrians, or his artwork isn't about necessarily some kind of grand political scheme. But because he was interested in literature, archaeology... He was a trained painter that went to art school. He was an amateur archaeologist. He was very involved in set designs for ballets and dramas and plays. He really understood a form of what you would call a total art, a grand work. I forget the exact... What, what is the exact German pronunciation for total art? Total art... German word. A uh, Gismatkunswerk. Gismatkunswerk. The total artwork that embodied every aspect from the materiality of the work of art to the subject matter to the very soul of the artwork and the artist itself. And I think that Nikolai Rorish came the closest to what you would understand as a total work of art, as a painter, as a mystic, a perennialist, a theosophist, and someone who a lot of people find very intriguing on the political right, now on the contemporary political right, for not obvious reasons. Even though I know that there's been this shift in the last few years, that, oh, you know, we're not going to be associated with people like Dugan, for very good reasons as well. That we're not going to be associated with like wholesome chungus their worldism, um, uh, as there's a lot of accounts I noticed recently of Indians that talk about the Indo Aryan thing. And they they basically they're like Indian, but they like wignap post, but they hate white people. It's a very strange, very strange. But there is a space to have an awareness of these collective wisdom traditions of the East and the West 
but in a way that is purely focused on a grand aesthetic and artistic vision that, it, that transcends contemporary political considerations. So you couldn't say, oh, I know some like ridiculous leftoids have been like, well, you know, if you like Nicholas Rorish, then, you know, you're like a Duganite or whatever. You're a, you're a third positionist. You know, like recently the people talking about Compact Magazine, like there's some evil right wing, you know, even though if you actually are on the political right, um, hmm, a lot of people aren't very big fans of Compact Magazine. And you're right. Let me tell you that. But anyways, they're very definitely afraid of this whole like third positionist talk, right? But the point being is that you wouldn't consider someone like Nikolai Rorish. You you couldn't consider him fitting into a political category. Because his work is not about that. You know? It's like, what, what did Christ say? My kingdom is not of this world. And in some ways, even though he was trying to... I know probably Bap or other people may have a different interpretation. But I don't think he was trying to find i mean in, in a sense he deeply admired a lot of the autocratic you know borderline theocratic societies of tibet and india and so forth that would entail a form of religious orthodoxy that if you were to resurrect a society based around the idea of shambhala but when you read nikolai rorish you don't get the sense that Maybe it's not of this world. Maybe it's... And, and even though the dream would be to resurrect this integralist, uh, mystical society, you know, where there's like ma magenta lighting everywhere in the city, and you have this glorious city where you'd have these mystic kings, uh, a mystical aristocracy. But I don't think that his ideas translate very easily into a political prescription. So let me read you this essay by an academic, a modern academic, that I found. It's called Difference and Sameness Secularity in the Case of Nikolai Rorish. And you can find this at Pars Journal for free. ParseJournal.com. Difference and Sameness Secularity in the Case of Nikolai Rorish by Esther Sizakas. I can't pronounce that. In my U. My M-I-U-O- like you as in you, like, you know, like the nobody TM video, you, which by the way, I will have a content minded dedicated to nobody TM one day, but I wanted to get guests on like Solion. I have this great episode about the Belgian system and about other things that are very interesting by Volpez, my good friend. We we're going to talk about Byung Cho Han, but then we didn't get to it. But the stuff we talk about is fascinating in terms of actual political theory that is very unique to the Belgians and the situation in Europe and so forth. And we also talk about, well, what else do we talk about? The paywall version is very interesting as well. So, but I have to edit that. It's like three hours long. Um, and I want to get Sully on to talk about a sub stack and, and the, the anime, younger zoomer anime people. And so I also trying to get other people on. I want to go back to getting guests, but of course me and me and Catherine, we get guests on all the time as well. So, and of course, I have to keep up with the Cole Report, you know, that's another thing. So, I will read this essay, and then I want to read you a passage on Tibetan art from Shambhala, his book, In Search of a New Era, which is a lot of, it's like half a travel journal as well. So, this article is called Difference and Sameness, and it's pretty long, but it's pretty meaningful. And so, I might, I might skip a few sections here and there. But it talks about the modern concept of secularism and how you can't necessarily easily fit a model of secularity in sort of the Eurasian mysticism of someone like Nikolai Rorish, who had both political and also spiritual and artistic influences. He had his hands in many different pots, you know, as you know. So let's finally get to the article. Uh, I might skip the introduction. So this essay aims to examine the problematize and problematize some aspects of the conceptual history, <laughs> conceptual history, I'm sure, I'm sure a good friend Carlsbad, wherever he is in Bulgaria, uh, appreciates this. The conceptual history of secularity in the case of the study of Russian theos uh, theosophist and painter Nikolai Rorish, 
from 1874 to 1947. More precisely, it looks... Uh, it's funny how he really died before the full brunt force of the Bolsheviks took hold. But he spent a lot of time in India, and I believe he went to America and so forth. But the conceptual history is very interesting because of... Before the Soviet Union, or even in the nascent days of it, you did have a lot of, from what I know, a lot of theosophist influence, a lot of these sort of Russian cosmicist schools of thought that were swept away by the tides of history by the Soviets. And nowadays, there, from what I know, there is sort of like a new awareness of this, these forms of spirituality that lay dormant in the Soviet Union. And even uh, a lot of Buddhists were even targeted, as well as the Orthodox Church, in various places where these Soviet satellite states, and then later with Maoism, came about. Um, the case of Tibet being the most famous, but also in Mongolia, and in uh, Nepal, and in other places. And they really did try to stamp out Buddhism as well as Russian Orthodoxy. Again, reaffirming that communism is an inherently evil, uh, you know, an evil demonic ideology. But anyways, more precisely, it looks at the conjunctions of secularity and politics to the traces of Rorish's messianic life project to bring about the mystical kingdom of Shambhala, a pan-Buddhist state in Central East Asia, a plan that also coalesced various conflicting stands or strands of political ideology. Following Charles Taylor, we treat secularity as it arises from the modernization process of European societies, through which religion is taken as only one option among other ways of self-fulfillment and human flourishing, the latter as indicator that self-sufficient humanism has never existed on the same scale before in Europe and European societies before the Enlightenment. So, it's very interesting using the work of Charles Taylor. Uh, his book, A Secular Age, is quite interesting. I haven't read all of it. It's been many years since I've read it, but... Essentially, it, Charles Taylor predicted a lot of what we know today as the sort of like free-for-all, liberal, post-Christian, secular society that doesn't necessarily have a guiding force the way that, let's say, uh, the modernist ethos does, where there is one consistent trajectory of enlightenment or progress or so forth but rather a sort of smorgasbord of different faiths, a approach to human flourishing that can be anything you make of it. That could be like mythopoetic or whatever remains of mythopoetic men's movement. Like there was this video I saw recently of the, these men crying in a, in a springs. They're like holding each other. Like that stuff along with a lot of the like weirdo neo pagan not neo pagan they're not real paganism but like weirdo africanized faiths that a lot of these like tiktok zoomer leftoids are into that combined with wicca and crystals but also it's got this weird third worldism attached to it but then you also have like school of life elaine de botten grifterism which is or even like manosphere stuff which, they're not the same, by the way. Like, in a way, Elaine de Botton is, like, the quintessential postmodern neoliberal type of hijacking of spirituality by rationalists, creating some kind of, like, uh, thoroughly utilitarian approach to what ancient philosophy was in Greece, but also what the wisdom traditions were. To basically hijack them and say, oh, we're going to create them, we're going to make them useful. And we're going to have the School of Life House where you get to read the great works and live in silence and minimalism. And, and then you also have the crunchy granola, you know, uh, I feed my husband breast milk. Uh, or, or you have like that new age rapper taking psychedelics, blah, blah, blah. Like all of this is a product of the secular age. All of this is a product of the great loss of a faith or faiths within the world picture, within a spherical Helios universe that, this is what John David Ebert says, right? That instantiated in civilization a particular worldview, and a particular view of a cosmology. 
But now that a singular cosmology has been decentered from that world picture, now you have this opening up of a secular age, what Charles Taylor calls a secular age. And you have all of this sort of what Spangler called the second religiousness, where people go crazy, people adopt anything, and you even have things that aren't exactly faith, but are used as a subterfuge, are used as a, a ersatz replacement for meaning. And a lot of people come, oh, the crisis of meaning and so forth. But people like Nikolai Rorish, especially at the time where you have in the 20th century, the full brunt of the Enlightenment, right? And I have, you know, nuanced views of the Enlightenment, but let's say the full brunt, especially in Eurasia, of the promise of modernism, which is deeply tied to communism. And right before that, you have this last effort of finding a mystical kingdom that is, you know, grates against what was becoming the norm of secularity. Of course, you know, Marxism becomes a form of, a weird form of faith that, it, that informs a particular civilization. But, you know, that's not here nor there. Nikolai Rorish, born in St. Petersburg uh, in 1874, is today renowned and also infamous figure in Russia and Western world, um, especially in the U.S. as well as, as in Asia. Rorish was a versatile figure. Ahead of his youth, ahead already in his youth, was drawn to archaeology and ethnography. Throughout his life, he published literary works. He was an especially prolific painter. 1910s, he was a successful stage designer, was regarded by many as a guru and a leader who also was a makeshift diplomat, was capable of exercising power and convincing people of the highest levels to support his cause in Central East Asia. So in a way, he was like, he had to go into the worldly. He had to like deal with the messiness of the political order at the time before communism to find a way towards a mystical kingdom, a dream that may not have been fully realized. Um, upon his father's wishes, Nikolai Rohr studied law in St. Petersburg and art at the Academy of Arts and Landscape Studio of Arkhip Kuninji. Throughout his career, Rorsch created more than 7,000 paintings of various themes and sets and series. His oeuvre is often contextualized within the broader art movement of symbolism. At the turn of the 20th century, Rorsch belonged to the conservative part of the Russian art circles. And see, notice how there was a conservative part in Russian art circles. It was not always well regarded by most European lenient Art Nouveau style groups and magazines. Uh, Mir is Kunstava, the world of art. Nevertheless, he collaborated with them. And, and in 1910, after the movement's heyday, he became its chairman. So again, he was literally a mystic reactionary figure that took over the decadent, you know, post Vienna secession, Gustav Klimt going and screwing different hieruses and, and the sort of decadence of Art Nouveau. Imagine that. Imagine a, a reactionary figure taking over the art world. I guess that's what Moldbug wants, but that's not going to, well, let's not, let's not talk about smack. I'm, I'm trying to keep, Content mind, you know, pure. Rorsch's most notable, highly regarded uh, theater design works were for Borden's Prince Igor, and particularly Stravinsky's La Sacre de Printemps. Uh, Printem uh, how do I say that? Printemps, with a production of Sergei Degilevev, uh, co-founder co of Mir Eskontovar, the magazine, and later founder of the ballet's Rus the Ballet of Russia, who trusted Rorsch as an expert in ancient history and Russian medieval architecture. So again, his artwork was very much in tune with the bricolage of mythologies that was present in Russia from the East and from the West. So that's a very important uh, facet. So 1905 paintings, Slavs on the Dnieper. This period was influenced by journeys and observations made in 1899, along with the ancient trade route from Lake Leng, uh, Ladoga to Novogorod, and in 1803 and 1904 to a range of old Russian cities such as Yaroslav, Krosoma, Uglich, Vladimir, Sudol, uh, Peskov, Isborsk, and Samolyansk, especially after his marriage to Helena uh, Shaposhnivkova, who I believe herself became a theosophist or a head of Theosophy Society. He turned towards mysticism, Eastern religions. 
Helena Rorish also acted as a medium to communicate the message of higher powers. So again, you do have a lot of the, the craziness and the mysticism that goes into the symbolist art movement at the time. I believe even Western symbolists, they did things like uh, consult psychics and spiritualists and so forth. Paul Etienne was infamous for this as well. Uh, together they created their own school of mysticism, the theosophy-based Agni Yoga in the 1920s. His oriental interest, and that's of course in you know, scare quotes, also signaled a shift in his paintings in the mid-1910s. He departed from the theme of roots of Russian culture and based his painterly works more on Eastern mysticism and spiritualism. So then you have these paintings of the Buddha and so forth, creating philosophical landscapes where the figures themselves, if you ever look at Rorish paintings, the figures and the way he paints them, the same color choices, the same tones, these figures are just as much integral to the landscape as the mountains, as trees, as rivers. They are sunk within the landscape in ways that a lot of Western symbolists, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Sebastian from Italy and even Gustav Moreau, they stand above the landscape, even in the Renaissance. So he's, his use of color is very interesting. The way that the figures melt into the landscape and they're very integral to it. Especially the one where you have the, uh, the mythical Buddhist warriors above in the sky, above this crimson orange sky. They're deeply a part of the nature that surrounds them. And of course he's getting this from his various oriental influences. Uh, the metaphorical mystical interpretation of the world subsequently defined the style and the iconography of Rorish's work when he practiced until his death. With their two children, later Tibetologist Yuri George Rorish and later painter um, Sevstislav Rorish, the couple emigrated in 1910 after the October Revolution from Russia to Finland, subsequently to London and then to the United States, and they finally settled in India in the 1930s. In terms of iconography, Rorish often merged motifs of Byzantine, Western Europe, and Oriental art, resulting in syncretic representations, such as the case of his Madonnas, Mother of the World in 1924, or Madonna Oriflamme in 1932. Oriflamme. Uh, even though Rorish produced a massive body of paintings, he is especially famous for his lavished and vibrant depictions of Himalaya, Tibetan, and Mongolian mountain ranges. His art, while its rep reception is still debated, uh, or his uh, yep, res uh, res uh, reception, we consider it rather circumstantial, not at the end of itself, but as a means, financial and spiritual, to fulfill a greater purpose. That is the ultimate goal of the so-called grand plan of Rorish was not merely intellectual or artistic, but to physically establish the mystical metaphorical kingdom of Shambhala, a pan-Buddhist state that would stretch across the political heavily charged territories of southern Siberia, Mongolia, and Tibet. To achieve, so again, Siberia being the furthest most of Russia that is in touch with the borders of the East. To achieve this, he departed in his first grand expedition to Central Asia and the Himalayas between 1925 and 1928, and on West, and on once his second so called Manchurian expedition to Central and East Asia, 1934 to 1936. To achieve all of his very complex goals, especially to realize the expeditions, um, Rorish inc uh, indiscriminately mobilized financial and diplomatic support from the Bolsheviks. The U.S. government, under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and wealthy private supporters who regarded him as their, as their guru, make a particular case of the intertwining of the secular and the religious, even the occult, on these missions. So I guess, I don't know, it was like, uh, I don't know, was, was he taking Theo Bucks as well before Theo Bucks was a reality? I don't know. Anyways, um, before Theo was even born. Uh, it, it's very interesting how, like, Bolsheviks and the U.S. government gave him support. And he was this, like, crazy Eurasian mystic that probably disliked the politics of both, uh, you know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you know, New Deal America and the Soviet Union. Isn't that crazy? You know, if only modern frogs were this bold to be a mystical artist, a cultist, but also take money from... Uh, you know, take taking money from mammon from everywhere you go, right? And there was a lot of things about uh, FDR and the communists. I mean, FDR basically was a communist sympathizer. 
But I, I like to think that Rorish played a fast one on both of them. But anyways. Rorish's highly complex life projection and life project, and particularly his political ties and motivations, however, contains still many nebulous parts, due to, also to the fact that many ideologically opposed forces are trying to claim Rorish's legacy as their own. Yeah, even like weird tankies. I, I mean, I know you see like Bappus on Twitter will talk about Rorish, but even like weirdo tankies, they they find uh, some, I don't know, I guess... Does Infrahaz know about Rorish? Probably. But, you know, even to this day, you still have this debate. The reception and contemporary interpretations of Rorish's, uh, Rorish over the last decade have been just as manifold as the activities of family itself. Of his family itself. After Nikolai Rorish and his work, uh, works were made to be forgotten in Stalinist Russia because of the religious occultist path. Oh, big shocker there. I wonder, uh, you know, I, I have seen some MAGA communists talk about Nikolai Rorish, but uh, I, how do they, like, square that circle? That they, uh, you know, tried to destroy the Orthodox Church, they tried to bury a lot of the occult societies and a lot of the uh, mystics that were in Eurasia at the time. I wonder how they square that circle, but anyways, that's not here nor there. If there's any, like, MAGA communists listening to this, I'd, I'd be happy to reply to... Uh, any, any, like, comment that you put in the, you know, YouTube or Twitter or whatever. The reception and contemporary interpretations of Rorish over the last decades, uh, because of the religious cult path, his rehabilitation started in the late 1950s. As John McCannon outlines, George uh, Rorish, his son, returned to the USSR from India in 1957 at the invitation of Nikita Khrushchev. <laughs> Major, so again, you know, Khrushchev, there was the reforms and the anti-Stalinist reforms and so forth. As a major expedition showcasing Rorish's paintings was organized in 1958 in Moscow, thus recanonizing Rorish as an artist, but not as a person of occultism, not to mention his political ties to various reactionaries, who also provides value during the Cold War to position the USSR as a propagator of world peace and friendly relations with Asia. So that's very interesting. I, well, I'll, I'll hold my commentary for this next part. However, the strongest supporter came later. The strong support came later, the strongest support, during Glasnost, when Mikhail Gorbachev embraced the Rorish legacy, eventually leading up to the securing of state funds for a Rorish Museum slash center in Russia in 1989, the so-called Soviet Rorish Foundation, and skyrocketing the interest in Rorish in the 1990s, especially in the 2000s. Well, because, again, what happened in the 90s? It was the revival of the New Age movement that, like, sort of lay dormant in the late 80s. Uh, all of the pavement paved the way for various oppositional claims claiming of Rorish as an ideal figure through the prism of anti-Marxism, nostalgia for communism, contemporary occultism, and esoteric movements, neo-Eurasianist ideas, which I believe, uh, you know, Dugan's written about uh, Rorish as well, Russian patriotism, a model for new kinds of international relations, as well as the art market through the increased value of Rorish's paintings at prestigious auction houses. Furthermore, the Rorish Museum, galleries, memorials, and research centers in Moscow, in Nagar, in New York, and in St. Petersburg, as well as different followings of Agni Yoga, today also contributed to the cultivation of an intricate Rorish legacy. So, yeah, international, religious, international relations done by occult mystics trying to forge a new path towards an ancient ideal of a glorious uh, a glorious Vajrayana city of Shambhala. That's sort of like this new Eurasian spirituality. But anyways, I'll skip ahead to the more relevant parts because it really uh, goes back and forth about his son and the museum in Moscow. And some of the, the skill at which he painted is quite incredible. Uh, and how they relate to um, the one in New York and so forth. And there's some kind of like funding issue or something. But what's really interesting is that, about that point about Khrushchev, is uh, you have like different political forces trying to claim Rorish. So they basically, the Soviets tried to gut him of all of this sort of spiritual metaphysical importance that can be perceived as reactionary and so forth but 
trying to craft like this multi culty we are the world diplomatic relations maxing version of Nikolai Rorish as like this is the artwork of the global south and so forth it's really ignoring the metaphysical importance of his work in favor of uh weirdo like you know weirdo multiculturalism type of thing that they were going at and of course a lot of people in america did this as well but from more of a liberal instead of like an explicitly marxist bent where it's like this is like the you know, liberal multicultural third worldism type of artwork but the complexity of Nikolai Rorsch sort of defies all of this. So let's get to the more relevant part of uh, the essay. And this is a uh, context of Russian avant-gardism, interest in other cultures and cosmicism. So again, this is his bridge towards the Russian cosmicist thinkers at the time. Inspired by Bolshevik, Bolshevik pro, uh, proclamations, Russian avant-gardists envisioned a revolution wedded with lost civilizations and religions. Well... They, they unfortunately backed the wrong horse, unfortunately, because then the Soviets really stabbed him in the back hardcore uh, under Stalin. So, well, what are you going to do? Sort of missed that part about religion and, uh, you know, class, uh, you know, an atheistic society. But Stephen Lee give, gives a colorful survey of the development of what he called the ethnic avant-garde. Examples of Rorsch's contemporary, contemporaries abound. Uh... Vladimir uh, Klebenikov had famously proclaimed that Russia must embrace its Asianness and spoke in favor of pan-Asian liberation in his an Indo-Russian Union manifest. While Alexander Bloch's uh, Scythians depicted the Bolsheviks as ancient nomadic tribe sweeping Eurasia in battles. Well, I mean, it's funny. Like again, this ties back to like the uh, the Duganite thing, right? But it, it's funny because there, there are like some weirdo uh, Russian nationalists that take a lot of the mythos of Teutonic Knights that were present in a certain Austri painter of Austrian's regime and they apply it to Russia. And I know that a lot of, for example, you always have these like Antifa threads that, you know, they try to deflect from the Ukrainian factions that are fans of the Austrian painter. And they're like, well, you know, in the Donbass militias, you have these far-right figures that have certain spinny wheel tattoos and so forth. So there's a lot of, like, uh, esoteria going on into far-right politics. But in this case, it was a weird form of, like, leftist communism that was, a, you know, it was like a weird form of communist ecumenism with Eastern spirituality. Among those who identified the distinct path of Russia between West, uh, West and East, modernism and antiquity is the state star of Russian futurism. Uh, Vladimir uh, Kalbinikov, more... How am I pronouncing that? Kalbinikov, yeah. More than in, uh, indigenizing the foreign term futurist, Kalbinikov himself coined and preferred the Russian uh, Butatalane, people of the future, Budintilane, Budintilane, people of the future, which one critic described as distinct from futurism in its embrace of the past. So uh, we all know the term that people, you know, right-wingers in the 2010s, specifically published by Countercurrents, or, well, no, actually, published by Architos. Is it published by Architos? Yeah. Although, you, you know the term I'm talking about, uh, archaeofuturism. So these ideas are much older than a lot of those, you know, a lot of those reactionary writers in the 2010s. But of course, uh, you know, Fea, he's sort of taken this like weirdo pro EU. I, I think he's like, from what I've heard, he's sort of like turned his back on a lot of the nouveau droit, like European new right ideals. He's sort of like a weird, uh, you know, weird NATO stand nowadays. I, I haven't confirmed that, but people have told me this. I've, I haven't kept up with, uh, you know, with Fea, but. Anyways, now they're here. We may disagree on the current conflict in Ukraine. This was the line in Kalbanikov's state, stated goal of enabling the human brain to grasp the ever elusive fourth dimension. So the line was its creation of new things grown on the magnificent traditions of Russian antiquity. That is the axis of time he envisioned artists and writers retreating to a quote independent nation of time, free from everyday life and consumerism. 
So in a way, like, Shambhala would be, like, the sacred city. The idea of a forbidden city or a sacred city where only the elect can enter into, even Plato had this notion, where the elect can enter into, they could, you know, traverse the holy mountain, they could enter the city, and they could be free of ordinary mortal political cultural, uh, you know, economic concerns. And in a way, that idea has been so thoroughly abandoned in the modern world that because it's inherently inegalitarian, but also that you could have a sort of reprieve in the world from the worldly is an idea that's so thoroughly alien to our contemporary consciousness when you really think about it. I mean, in some ways, the internet creates some of these communities, but these, these communities are very porous, and they're always feeding back into the consensus uh, reality or the consensus concerns of everyday life and events and happenings and memes that you really can't have this isolated, forbidden city of spiritual purification that has become impossible. The notion itself seems laughable. It's almost like people that say... Uh, what is it like? Uh, well, the Vatican should sell all their artwork and give, you know, everything to the poor. Or some, like, ridiculous utilitarian yeast life, life viewed from the stomach notion. Whereas the Holy See should be, like, a city within the city, a sacred city within Italian society. And it should be kept pure. But, of course, people don't have this notion. Because it's like, uh, they only view... The only form of sacredness they view is through the stomach that we should uh some like ridiculous notion of egalitarianism or whatever and they don't really care about higher ideals because their higher ideals are thoroughly of the earth and not in, in like a romantic nietzschean way but of the earth in the sense that it's uh you know basically gives maxing they're like that's their utopia it's not really they don't really you know most modern people i wouldn't say most well yeah i would say most but like most normie cattle they don't... <laughs> I know I shouldn't use this words. I know I'm... I, I shouldn't have scorn on people. That, that you know, the whole language of normies is probably not... You know, it probably is an impediment to one's spiritual growth. But I would say that most people, they don't have this notion that, oh, what do you mean? That's crazy talk. That you have, like, this center of spiritual power that operates wholly independently from the society around it. That you should keep it and you should preserve it. And it's important for the spiritual health of a civilization. But they're like, oh, what about the funding for that? What about the what about building more homes for migrants? It's like, no, it's you know what I mean? Like, people don't really have an because the only way you can have these type of things is if you value the importance of those things in a civilization to begin with. And when you've destroyed that notion, much in the way that the Bolsheviks destroyed the notion of a previous Tsarist civilization in Russia, then of course you don't have these higher spiritual values. Of course you're not going to build Shambhala. Because it, it, those things are totally irrelevant to the age of matter. You have to remember, that's what Kali Yuga means. It's the age of matter. To where even matter infiltrates the higher mind, the Atman, the consciousness of most people. To where they only think of things that are weighed down by thoughts of matter and concerns of matter. And so this is what we mean by life viewed from the stomach. Is that there's no higher ideals to where we can even fund and build a glorious spiritual city of the elect. To be walled away from mortal concerns. That's an irrelevancy to most people. That idea is crazy. That's like some kind of like... That's like in science fiction. That's like something I'd see in some kind of Star Wars spinoff. That's something the, 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 what are they called? The Empire? I don't even know. I've never seen Star Wars. That's like something in my Mufugan, uh, sci-fi fantasy where like these, uh, you know, Brahmins wall themselves off from people. And that's, you know, our wholesome Chungus multicultural freedom fighters. They liberate people by, fighting the evil theocrats and they, you know, return Gibbs to people or some kind of like girl boss socialism or whatever. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm getting off the road. So let's, let's continue. So when it comes to, uh, to futurism or to cosmicism, while Rorsch himself is not considered a cosmicist par excellence, he ties his, he ties to artists closer to the movement, such as the group, um, Amaravella, 
uh, has has been as asserted. Russian cosmicism had at its center notions of cosmic evolution. Where, well, I mean, later on, uh, you know, in the West, people talked about like the human potential movement or creative evolution. Or uh, there was uh, that one lady that wrote those books, Aquarius, the Aquarius series, Aquarius Rising. I think I have a few of those books. Anyways, futurism, human resurrection and immortality, scientific technological advancement. So again, this is very much precursor to, uh, in some weird ways, Silicon Valley rationalist transhumanism. But they're way more mystical and way less, I mean, they were LARPing, but they were way less LARPy than uh, all these like big Yuddites, you know? Anyways, the uh, don't don't uh, talk about what Ayala does. Uh, never mind, never mind. Trying to keep this, uh, kind of, you know, trying to keep this highbrow, especially in relation to space travel, as well as occult and esoteric ideas. And so again, this influenced a lot of, even though, even though Russian society was gutted of uh, mysticism and tradition and so forth, well, for a time, those things were suspended. Then there was, uh, you know, under Khrushchev, and especially by the time you get to Brezhnev, there was a laxening of that hardline atheistic approach. But this still influenced something that was deep within the Russian spirit. Hence the obsession with space travel. Hence the, the you know, by today's standards, billions of dollars... And uh, so many dead cosmonauts that have gone unreported. And, you know, uh, Laika, the dog, and uh, Sputnik, and uh, Yuri and Dropov, and so forth. Like, the, the mythology is there. And there's something about uh, this space in particular. There was this uh, there was this book about the Orthodox Church and Russian cosmo cosmicism. And there was this other book about orthodoxy. And uh, the nuclear bomb. I think it was called a nuclear church or something like that. You'd have like uh, Orthodox priests blessing nuclear warheads. And, you know, it's a, again, in, in some ways, it's a physical manifestation of getting at something more, more spiritual, more inward, if you will. Uh, in a way, it's, it's sort of in keeping with that sort of mortification of the worldly the sort of death to the world type of ethos, you know, there's something very, hence why I think a lot of them gravitated to punk rock, but anyway, I'm going on a tangent. So it was, imagine Silicon Valley, but like Silicon Valley, if they didn't like abandon its, um, its new ageism, like they did after the 1990s. Cause a lot of those people, and there's a lot of nefarious connections as well to bio, let's call it bioluminescent forces when you talk about, for example, the Eastland Institute and how there was various Silicon Valley people that were going there and listening to lectures by people like Terrence McKenna and Douglas Ruskov was there and Timothy Leary and these people were, you know, they were tuning out, but that's how they like became programmers and there's a whole thing and even uh, Thiel allegedly is involved in this. There's uh, I don't know if I should mention... Uh, off ah, who cares i know he pisses a lot of people off but i know uh marcel D dumas he has that whole series about the various links between psychedelia and the new right and peter thiel going to eastland and they're even like i, I read this marxist blog from way back in the 2010s ba back when the, like the post left thing was going strong it's called synthetic zero they have this very this long but very good essay about Silicon Valley, the New Age movement, and uh, the appropriation of these like human potential movement ideas by various uh, both corporate and government forces. It's quite a good essay. If you look up the blog Synthetic Zero, I believe a few people have written. It's like a team of people, but anyways. Similar to the height, heightened contemporary interest in Rorish, Cosmicism also previously banned because of the affinity with religiosity, had, again, so, you know, they, the Soviets couldn't pin it down. Had just recently resurfaced in Russian philosophic, philosophical intellectual discourse. Starting from the late 1980s to early 1990s, and peaking in more recent years, due to cosmicism's syncretic nature, and again, not unlike the legacy of Rorish, it lends itself to leading or being deployed by 
not only technological utopian optimism, but also eugenics. Oh boy. And na or nationalism. Oh no. Oh. That's a naughty, naughty, no, no. You mean people that are grounded within, uh, you know, uh, spirituality that is uh, unique to the particular life world of particular people, that they would entertain nationalistic ideas? Oh, boy. I, you can't have that. Huh. You get what I mean by right-wing art not being, like, quote-unquote, right-wing art? Do you start to get the picture a little bit? When you have ideas that are a bit higher than contemporary politics, what you can entertain or not just get away with, but what you can craft in the world vision that you possess what morris graves the amazing northwestern visionary painter called the inner eye of the artist right you, you, does it sort of make sense here but then when people like this or that ghoul in england that never mind i'm not going to mention him by name because honestly he doesn't deserve it when they like dox people or group chats or artists and they're like oh you're evil right wing blah 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 you get what i you get what i'm talking about here when you don't make it so on the nose, but it is the only way that you can craft something is if you create meaningful works to begin with. If you strive for an integral art that is something more than just a commentary on contemporary conditions. Anyways, recently prominent contemporary art theorists, artists, and art institutions have also started to re-examine Russian cosmicism as we unpack the conceptual history around religiosity, recurring in political debates, every life in the following section will end up considering socialist realism and Rorish's mystical worldism as two sides of the same coin well mm, we'll see about that on progress power and secularity taylor asserts that modernization brought about a paradigm shift in conce concepts which manifests itself in the distinction we make today and of course the root of conceptual history being like you you have to I'm not that well versed because of conceptual history, but you have to uniquely pay attention to the context and the various thinkers and social conditions and and undercurrents of thought that thinkers were responding to at the time, even artists or writers and so forth. Such as that between the imminent and the transcendent, the natural and the supernatural. Remember, in a secular age, according to Terror, all those things collapse. There is imminent and transcendent in the same order, right? Well, we'll get to that. Uh, crucially, compared to the medieval man for whom the transcendent is, only, is the only con construct of the world, is our ability to understand both sides of the economy. Co uh, dichotomous concepts, regardless of which side we take, that marks the modern conceptual world. Well, as opposed to Taylor, a lot of people that have a cyclical view of history say that the metaphysical or the transcendent is then abandoned. From Spangler to Marty Glass to Shuon to uh, even contemporary people like Charles Upton in his book, uh, Spectres of the Counter-Initiation. Uh, counter this can be seen, in, for instance, in the hiving off of an independent freestanding level, that of nature, which may or may not be, may or may not be in interaction with something further or beyond. Nature is then reified nature is divorced from us of course it is exactly this differentiation that has come back as a specter in contemporary society for this kind of, ex of differentiation confirms only difference of the same thereby essentially leaving the same conceptual structure intact how can a society that on one hand is to a great extent intolerant to certain religious practices and on the other experience the res and on the other hand experiences the resurgence of certain spiritual if not religious aspirations be accounted for so again it's only a half bifurcation because now you're still open you can never close that pandora's box of the transcendent but when you do again this is brings back this is more young than even charles taylor right when you try to close it off things will come in to take its place because that same source that same all that same Ottman, that same one is still there god christ conscious whatever the point being is that you can never destroy fully this impulse now the mistake would be to say that oh well that impulse is a product of biology and it's like uh if you can hack that like when richard dawkins you remember back in the 
2000s Richard Dawkins and people like that, they were fascinated by the God helmet. And that didn't go anywhere because it really, like anything could really mimic a euphoric experience. But that doesn't translate to any personal or grand revelation. Because that's the mistake of saying that, well, that impulse is a biological thing. And when you really go hard into things like Evo Psych, you really miss the forest for the trees. That's my opinion, but well, whatever. The point being is that this is what Charles Taylor is saying, is that there's a fundamental disruption in this dichotomy of, well, moderns can have their cake and eat it too, but at the same time, we don't really tolerate that much about from the transcendent, but we still see this like weird resurgence of other very kooky, disparate uh, things that don't make sense. So, anyways, time appears as a more important vector in the discussion of secularity. Secular comes from seculum, a century or age or a shared world of human experience. Death of God theologian Gabriel Vanahan argues that seculum does not, am I pronouncing it, seculum, seculum, does not mean the opposite to sacred in the primary sense, but instead underlies the secondary opposition between sacred and profane. For a seculum is a theological notion which implies that we live in a world of eminence, which for, functions as the location of human and divine meaning and value. Taylor emphasizes the disenchantment of time. People who are in the seculum are embodied in ordinary time. Like the Kali Yuga, like the time of matter, they're living the life of ordinary time as against those who have turned away from this in order to live closer to eternity. The world is thus used for ordinary as against higher time. But now you have a much smaller number of people who have dropped out of that secular time, but, but their engagement is much more heterodox, much more involved than even previously because of a whole civilization worshipping like a medieval Christendom. The world spirit, the world picture of that concentric dome from which all of the iconotypes bask, in which the heliocentric model of, of the cosmos was in place for everybody. But now only the few experience that. But notice this crucial distinction, and this will get back to the work of art. Because I don't think I will... I'll have to probably carry on this... This. Uh, oh, it talks about liberalism in the next one, but in the next paragraph. But this is... Notice this crucial distinction. If you were to take anything away from this, and I'll try to tie it back to the work of art. I'm trying not to speak in circles here, which I usually do. But notice how Charles Taylor takes the original Latin meaning of secularism or secularity. It does not mean non-religious. It does not mean, or rather, it does not automatically imply atheism or atheistic, uh, the absence of religion. It is not a negative nothing. It is not a ex nihilo. What it means is simply the worldly, simply that which is profane. And this is what Charles Taylor is saying. Is that Charles Taylor, and again, he, he's probably getting this from Agamben and other people, when you talk about paradoxes within thought. The paradox being that we like to think that there's a stark dichotomy, and they're totally different. There's secularism, and then there's religion. There's secular, multicultural, multi-faith, liberal democracy, and there's theology, the, uh, theocracy. There's like the Mujahideen, there's a, you know, Yal Qaeda versus the, you know, the Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett. God rest his smutty soul. But the point being is that, and I generally do pray for him and Hitchens. I'm not, I'm not joking with that. But the point being is that what Charles Taylor is saying is that no, and this is why Charles Taylor is an interesting thinker. Not that I agree with everything he says, because at the end of the day, he is a lib. He is an NDP voting lib in University of Toronto. And, he, and that Foucault essay was terrible. I hated it. Every single political theory student in Canada at the grad level had to read that stupid essay where he totally disregards Michel Foucault. 
But that's besides the point. Charles Taylor still is a brilliant thinker, even though he's a lib. But the point being is that he upends his own liberalism selectively. I was talking about this, actually, I was talking about this in grad school one time with a follower of Charles Taylor. He's like, well, Charles Taylor will invert things and he'll go back on it and he'll like, he'll do like a selective reversal of his own ideas and so forth. So what Charles Taylor is doing is undermining his own liberal priors right here, which I think is it's a digression, but I'll, I'll lead it back into the work of art. And you can tell I'm getting fired up right now because thank God I'm talking about something else besides politics. What Charles Taylor is doing is he is reversing that assumption that there is a fully separate secularity. When rather, those two things are one and the same. The way that a perennialist would look at it. That there is a sacred and there is the profane. Even certain Christian theologians. Certainly Augustine would look at it this way. There is the worldly. There is the transcendent. But they are not separate. The profane, the secularity is rather to Charles Taylor. A sort of free zone, an open, to use an Agambian phrase. An open by which faiths engage. By which the transcendence comes into human form. By which the transcendence meets the worldly and the profane. And they are together in that same system. It is not the assumption of most libtards nowadays which is that secularity is this wholly distinct thing and it's crushing religion and it's taking religion back into the private home, the bedroom, whatever, the church, that it's like this separate private public distinction. What Charles Taylor is saying is that that's not reality and that never will be reality. Secularity merely denotes a distinction between the sacred and the profane. And uh, that's pretty much it. So, but notice how this leads back to someone like a figure like Nikolai Rorish. Now, I have a reactionary or whatever, right wing, whatever you want to call it, interpretation. Of course, there's Marxists that interpret him. There's multicultural liberals that find some enjoyment. Not, not so much in recent times. Because again, people, they look at him and they're like, oh, that's like what Dugan believes in. But the point being is that from my interpretation... Someone like Nikolai Rorish was acutely aware of that distinction, but had a hope that the transcendent can meet the worldly, that Shambhala can become physical as much as it is spiritual. And his artwork upends that distinction of what we think a secular age really means. Right at the cusp, of peak secularism, atheistic communism, right at the cut, right before he died, when the Soviets, when the Bolsheviks took over the Soviets, and then Stalin, and World War II, where people became utterly disenchanted more than ever, even, even someone like Hannah Arendt talks about this. World War II and the mid-20th century contributed more to secularity than anything else, and it was an utter shame. She, even someone who's like a liberal, like Hannah Arendt talks about that. But right before that, you have someone who is offering, dare I say, another way forward. What could have been. And so that is the importance of Nikolai Rush. But let's, let's move on. Whether the conflation of human and divine experience together or the carving out of ordinary time against higher time, time becomes a dimension through which worlds are played out. So again, Time is acute to this. Remember, Nikolai Rorsch's paintings, they look like they are outside of time. They could be scenes from the 4th century or the 40th century. From the 20th century to the 2nd century. But that's because he's operating at a higher level. In this theological view of time, non-Western cultures were or still are relegated to an earlier stage of development. The Muslim world is an example. Or the benevolent side of the same coin. They're romanticized and often categorically depicted as frozen in, prist in a pristine past. Tibet and its theocracy, for example. But this is wrong. Because we like to think of it that way. That they're frozen. Maybe the Taliban, but I have complicated thoughts about the Taliban. Anyways, 
The point being is that we say that, oh, well, you know, they're throwing it in the past, man. That's like basic modern liberal assumptions about time. But in reality, what people like Taylor is saying is that, no, they participate in that same time frame, in that same duration, in the same temporality that you or me, as rootless moderns, as we participate in. They're still with us. They're not, I mean, maybe not some, not some of them. I mean, maybe some of them are immortals. Who knows? The point being is that the world has split off, but still we are in that same world system. We're in that same time. So someone like Nikolai Rorish and his works of art can be both outside of time and within time. Because remember, he's still painting mountains and trees with those divine figures. But at the end of the day, they're still like the Zen Koan. Or sorry, it's a literati painting Chinese proverb. Uh, no, actually, it does come from Zen. Zen landscape painters that learned a lot from China. That you start painting the mountains and trees. Then you reach Satori. What happens at the end of Satori? The mountains become mountains and the trees become trees. There's no... At the end of the day, they're still there. Even after you've achieved that revel revelation of what the mountains and trees are. Nikolai Rohr still painted mountains and trees. But they are transformed by something else. Anyways. For both there are always groups with power. And those whose interests are best served under the conditions of history. They're Telos as Telos in recent years. So history as Telos. Nikolai Rohr thought that. That history does have a Telos. And even the average... Uh, the average Liptard no longer thinks that there's a Telos, by the way. There's no longer the Kantian perpetual peace, the Enlightenment values. So this is something that Paul Godfrey, to bring in Paul Godfrey, was correct. Modern liberalism does not have a Telos anymore. It doesn't envision a glorious future. Modern liberals, modern Libtards, they envision... Modern transnational progressivism envisions a reification and intensification of the present that's their future more of the same but without any opposition that's their futurism and uh, a lot of people in academia and so forth and other writers or whatever they can cope about it but that's the reality uh solion has a great essay actually on substack about what liberals fear they fear this Recursion of time. Anyways. Oh boy. Oh boy. Served under the conditions of history as Telos. In recent years, the West has experienced categorical reactions to Muslims as other. In the eloquent study, Islam and Liberalism, 2015, Joseph Massad, Massad, not Massad, Massad, M A S S A D, traces how liberalism has systematically established dualistic oppositions between Islam, Europe, and Protestant Christianity. Meaning, of course, the whole, like, rhetoric of the, the Crusades, but then that gets flipped under Obama from Bush. Western democracy and Oriental despotism. Europe slash Christian women's freedom and Muslim women's slavery. Europe slash European American actual freedom and Islamic repression and oppressiveness of desires and practices. The tolerance of modern Europe and the intolerance of Islam and Muslim. This classic, classic, dis not that I, not that I say that I, I, I think a lot of them, most of them, in fact, all of them should go back. But, you know, remigration, all that stuff. But I think the way you approach it is different than this, like, Douglas Murray version of conservatism. Where it's just the neocon, they hate us for our freedoms. They hate us because of gay marriage. They hate us because of women's lib. That is, if you are a right-winger and you are still saying that in 2024... Uh, like, you're not gonna make it. You know that video by T7 says, uh, a lot of you guys are not gonna make it. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be mean, but that was a Thomas 777. Uh, a lot of you guys are just not gonna make it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the truth. Uh, like Ghost used to say, Ghost True Capitalist Radio, hey, it's the truth. Uh, <laughs> I always loved when he was like that, although, I don't know, he's been boomer posting recently. Uh, in, every day, in the everyday, we are confronted with practices that seemingly pertain to a religious order, such as the wearing of a headscarf in societies of modern Islam. 
Is our reaction not victims of the normative function of secularism? Drawing on Deleuze and Guattari, his analysis, Ian Buchanan, not, not, you know, not Pat Buchanan, Ian Buchanan, sees the French Muslim schoolgirl's voluntary wearing of the foulard, the headscarf, as an act of neo-territoriality, an archaism with a perfect modern function. Well, you know, I mean, that strays off into third worldism, but I do get the point, you know. The hegemony and normativity of liberalism is based on the moral superiority coextensive to the conceptual structure of difference of the same. Hence, the universe, universalization of secularity becomes a weaponized ideal against the Muslim community. Again, this strays off into, like, leftist or worldism, which I don't exactly endorse either. But I do think there's a point to say that in some ways, Faustian man conquered himself with secularism. Secularism, in some ways, was a national progression, but at the same time, I do think that you can't really... You have to only fight fire with fire. You only have to fight fire with a known position of who you are. Not this negative nothing, that modern secularism, or modern notions of secularism, not ancient forms of secularism. Uh, promise. Behind these ideological debates, often a bland... A blatant political game resides, leading to wars in the name of rescue and help. Talal Assad rightfully argues, quote, violence is embedded in the very concept of liberty that lies at the heart of liberal doctrine. That concept proposes that morally independent individuals' natural rights to violent self-defense is yielded to the state, and the state becomes a sole practitioner of individual liberties. Well, that could work. I will counter-signal that leftist or world discourse to say that, yes, Liberalism did function like that. But when liberalism is about importing the world and forgetting who you are, then that equation is different. So again, this this is sort of like a lot of these lefties, they're kind of stuck in the, you know, Bush era. In the West now, the normativity of secularity serves concrete domestic power leverage, such as those propagated by rightist movements, the very heart of Western societies, banning the burqa, the burkini, in all these public outcries, the fundamental idea of the self versus the other, the difference to the same can be discerned, which in turn validates the position taken on secularity versus religiosity. Well, I would... No, but here's the thing, though. Because someone like Nikolai Rorish offers a different path. Because that is also something that doesn't serve rightist interests. Like, I know there's, like, nowadays there's a secular Nietzschean right, whatever. But... The point being is that the full brunt of secularity has been wielded by liberals against the political right as well, especially in North America. In Europe, things are a little bit different, but it's the same as well in Europe. So I don't agree with that sentence. I think that there's a more nuanced take on how secularism, as it is described by moderns, has also not benefited the political right. But there is one more paragraph to go. In this section, there's another one about geopolitics and another one about scientism, which it's getting sort of uh, long in the tooth. So I will I'll meet you. Well, well, OK, well, let's get through this one. Let's get through this one. So when one analyzes his paintings, Rorish can be seen to have consciously and unconsciously participated in the romanticization of the Orient. Oh, again, here we go with Orientalism. His life path, however, suggests something even more curious. As John McCannon pointedly highlighted in his essay on Rorish, his spiritual geopolitics, Rorish was interested in the cultures and religions of Central and East Asia in as much as he could in integrate them into his own eclectic mysticism centered around the realization of Shambhala and the coming of Maitreya, the Buddha of the future, Maitreya, in this unfolding of which he saw himself and his wife as key figures. Again, very much, you could accuse him of creating a cult of personality like everyone did at the time. But, I mean, hey, that's never left us. Nowadays, people still do it. McKinnon likewise highlighted that despite the fact that Rorish was initially in line with his time's anthropological understanding about the origins and past of indo aryanic culture and was once keen on historical geographical exitude, his turn towards the occult yielded a more metaphysical a metaphorical interpretation that in the flattening of differences in cultures in his mind. Again, this isn't multiculturalism per se, but he was trying to find the root of something within Indo-Iranic, Indo-European culture. The, quote, virtually identical nature of, for example, 
the Himalayan people, especially Tibetans, and while a, a bunch of other, uh, you know, traditionalist and pranalist people have said this because, but you know, it, it, it verges into, uh, you know, the naughty, naughty, no, no words, right? Virtually identical nature, for example, the Himalayan peoples, especially Tibetans, he encountered on his expeditions and the red indigenous he met during his travels in the American Southwest. And as we know, Shuan, uh, well, I kind of, Shuan's kind of complicated because he did get into a lot of trouble and there's a lot of various stuff that uh, recently, if you can, you can find it on YouTube. But if you search Charles Upton in Fritjof Shuan, there's this recent interview, by recent I mean like this a few weeks ago, or even a week ago, interview with Charles Upton by this Catholic uh, YouTuber that he goes into the various problems of Fritjof Shuan, which I think is very good. It's like three hours long, but it's great. Hopefully you listen to this one, uh, after, you know, then you'll go to that one. If the benevolent version of an oriental orientalist gaze, oh, here we go, Cast the other in anachrony and romanticizes it as harboring higher truth other than the self. Then Rorish has reproduced the structures, maximized its inherent problematics, less by reinforcing the other than the same, but by inserting himself into the other and performing exactly the anachronism that defines it. His actions could have constituted a neo territoriality, albeit one that needs to be rewrite the rules of authenticity as one who is entitled to speak for whom, yet conditioned by the difference of the same schema, his purpose, his proposals seemed incongruous with the expectations on either side, as we shall see. So again, he's saying that both East and West, they're not going to like his proposal. But notice how it still can be, I will give this academic something, because a lot of modern Delusians are just libtards, and so they'll never grant this point. But he's saying that even, and this is what DNG was saying, is that even, I know I'm, I'm gunning through thinkers here, but even a neo-territoriality can be possessed by the right, can be possessed by a reactionary, can be possessed by someone who's quote-unquote problematic, by creating something anew, by going to these other cultures and, and, and creating a bridge, and that bridge becomes an open space. A lot of modern contemporary Delusians where people in academia, like academic theory cells, they're like, oh no, this is terrible. This is neocolonialism. This is other colonialism. This is, this is, uh, you know, invading on our wholesome chungus indigeneity. But this is not the concern of Nikolai Rorish. So this academic, these two academics are actually honest enough to say that, yes, it is a neo-territoriality. It's, it's from their view, from their liberal view, a problematic one to the modern, to the contemporary theory cell in academia. It's, it's problematic. It's Orientalism. You know, everything that Edward Said warned us about. But it's still a neo-territoriality. It's still a disruption of arborescent... Uh, it's still a disruption of arborescent patterns. It's a smooth space rather than a striated. Any Delizia metaphor you want to use. It's still a nomadic activity. Even if it's from a place of reactionary mysticism and so that is important but notice how it's leading up to this part and i'll read it because the next part is very important on scientism and then i'll, I'll probably paywall that one but let's read a little bit of geopolitics then and now parallel to the intellectual history the conflict around tibet start uh, starting from the 19th century onwards are complex and have left the region in vulnerable position Tibet has been overshadowed in the great game between the British and the Russian expansionist forces. Well, what about the Chinese? And in the extension into the Cold War and post-Cold War era, but which is beyond the scope of this article. As the, as the Qing dynasty, the Qing, the imperial monarchy in China, collapsed in 1911, regions that were not under direct rule or had not been for a very long time, but had been in... in integrated into the empire, I was going to say ingratiated, in integrated into the empire in a tributary uh, relation, found themselves enmeshed in a global movement of nationalism. Following the Bolshevik, quote, declaration of the rights of the people, which again, very anti-nationalism, 
in which peoples of the empire were bestowed the rights to national self-determination and essential, essentially to form sovereign state, states. Well, that wasn't reality, was it? Because then what happened afterwards? Then Maoism came along. And now Tibet, the Tibetans are still a subjugated people. So there you go. The U.S. President Woodrow Wilson, again, another communist sympathizer, embraced the self-determination principle and popularized it as the fundamental way for a post-imperial world. Woodrow Wilson, post-imperial world. That really rings a bell, does it not? Does that not really uh, say something about how deep this runs, the subversion? Not to say that America itself is subversive, but look at from Wilson to from Wilson, then you fast forward to FDR. FDR being a real communist sympathizer. Yet, as Reynolds rightfully pointed out, the principle was accommodated when it served the interests of the great powers and bent when it did not. Consequently, backed by the British and the French, Poland was strategically attributed a part, despite its ethnographically being only one-third non-Polish, to create a buffer zone between Germany and Russia. Remember, and there's various thinkers that talk about this, but of course that line of thought in elite theory especially, has been become verboten. What have the great powers, not naming who they are, but let's, you know, for YouTube purposes, but any, like, let not even, like, I, would, I wouldn't even blame the Anglos. I'm, again, I think Dugan is wrong for blaming the Anglos for everything. But the powers in Europe at the time, in the dawn, the empire is waning. They never wanted, and this is a legitimate, scholarly academic theory and in historical texts that the stated goal was never a unity between germany and russia because the germanics and the slavs the russians getting together would spell an immense power imbalance in europe and even to this day the germans are some of the biggest haters of russia of course they it's not because of not like uh you know not in the same sense. I and mean, this is where I disagree with, uh, you know, Putin and the whole, like, third worldism of the Russians. It's not that Germany, they're, like, secretly Austrian painters again. No, they're libtards. They hate Russia from, a, like, a current Russia from a liberal perspective. From a transnational, not liberal, not liberal in the classical sense, or rather the older sense, as Godfrey would have it. But rather transnational progressivist sense. That's why they hate Russia. Because of the political class in Germany. I mean, who knows? Maybe, I'm not saying the AFD will ever form a government, but you know. The point being is that there's a reason why the subversion in Germany has gone, has run deep. And now they hate Russia for entirely different reasons. That have cut across the political spectrum. In the Middle East, one of the interests of connecting with the overseas colonies, as well as creating a power balance against Russia, the British and the French created mandate zones and effectively took control over Iraq and Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, respectively. And of course, the other nation in the Middle East. As Rorish planned in Sh as Shambhala expeditions, both Tibet and Mongolia made for increasingly important leverage for geopolitical interests in Central Asia, Inner China, and East Asia, against an increasing militant Japan. Not disheartened by the geopolitical turmoil, indeed absorbed in his own mission, Rorish walked on thin ice when carrying out his plan with partners such as the USSR and the USA. Rorish, so again, he's one man with the strength, the fortitude, the artistic vision to aestheticize his geopolitics, to cut through political dichotomies of the profane, to create a new order. One man did this, and he played the USS and the USSR against each other. Sorry, the USA, you know. Rorish left for the first expedition from New York when the family was residing in the early 1920s. They traveled first to Sikkim, to Sikkim with the ultimate goal to reach Tibet from there, which in effect transpired at his desire to unite all Tibetan Buddhist people of Asia and the sac sacred union of the East. That is to bring about Shambhala. Yet the magnitude of support he was able to accumulate from various sides Attest to the fact that Rorish's mystical geopolitical plan that was put forth as the expedition to paint landscapes and do archaeological research was in its principles not so out of touch with reality. As McKinnon notes, 
1920 and 1930s, British, Chinese, Japanese, Mongolian, and Soviet authorities equally considered it dangerously plausible that someone like Rorish, appealing to local traditional heritages, could ignite Asia and thus negate the former's ambition. One man to unite the Asians. A European man that could rival the great powers to create a sacred city through the work of art Nikolai Rorish is a man of history. The closest we have come to of a man of history among the other ones in the 20th century, in the 19th century. Therefore, for his first journey with American supporters, Rorish managed to gain help, permission to enter Soviet territory and supplies for travels from the USSR as well in return for the hope of, among other things, the expansion of Soviet influence in Asia or undermining British rule in India. The expedition in the first attempt of the Great Plan, however, fell through as the Tibetan border when Rorish and his team were halted for five months during the harsh winter and only let it be rushed through Tibet to arrive to Sukhum. There, thanks also to the workings of a British spy tracking Bolshevik activities. In the second and later expeditions, Rorish had formed a different plan. The mission was funded by the U.S. government under the guise of a botanical expedition for drought-resistant grasses that could help alleviate the U.S. Dust Bowl crisis. Do the f so again, he's using... Uh, modern crises to further his goals. Due to the few fact that Henry A. Wallace, Secretary for Agriculture under FDR, was initially a great supporter of Rorish's occult teachings. Uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Occultism. Guy in worship, hello. This time Rorish hoped to use Mong Mongol revolts against the Bolsheviks, who had hardened their religious policy to the discontent of the Mongolian Buddhists, while at the same time siding with the Japanese who had occupied the vast territory of China's Manchuria and offered to ally with the immense neighboring Mongolian territories. To, of course, to go after the Han, uh, well, that's actually pretty based. En route to Mongolia, Rorish was stopped by Japan and he acted like a U.S. dignitary without any official decrees and praised J Japanese operations in the occupied Manchuria. His scheme, however, backfired. J Japanese intelligence, instead of embracing Rorish, started a smear campaign against him in the press which was coupled by queries from the U.S. press about the government's involvement in the expedition. And finally, Wallace suspended his support and turned against Rorish when it became clear that he was rather a diplomatic embarrassment, all of which forced Rorish not only to abandon his great plan, but also to remain in India until his death. Rorish's extensive plan for unification of the East also resonated with Russia's current neo-Eurasianist aspirations and anti-Western stance. Here we go, I knew it was coming, as Marcus Osterder outlines his manifest of the geopolitical Grand East Bolshoi Vostok strategy coming into force, especially under the second presidency of Vladimir Putin, who also built on the premise, prominent status that Rorish was able to establish for themselves in Asia. So now we have the scientism one, which I will carry on into the paywall. And hopefully you can join me because I will read from Shambhala, his essay on Tibetan Buddhism. But let's take a break. Join me on Patreon and Substack, and I will talk about the significance of Rorish and geopolitics, and I will also talk about the essay in uh, Shambhala about Tibetan art itself. So hopefully you will join me. Please like, share, and subscribe. Please support my channel and uh, support the content renaissance. I have much more things to talk about when it comes to Nikolai Rorish, one of the greatest artists in our life, well, not our lifetime, but within the modern era, in my opinion. So I'll see you over there.